Dear Lord, we praise you for your wonderful works in our life. Father, we praise you for your strength. As a family, we gather to listen and meditate upon thy word, dear Father. You are the source of the wisdom. Your wisdom, you have given your wisdom to humanity. Dear Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask forgiveness because we recognize we are sinners. Lord, touch our hearts and minds in this precious moment. Also, we remember we have been betrayed you in various ways, thoughts, actions. Oh, dear Father, we humbly request you, please forgive us, dear Father, so that we may can see you, we may can listen. Touch our hearts, Lord. Touch our minds, Lord. Especially, we please, your servant who is ready to share your message to your Father. Anoint his lips. Oh, dear Father, once we listen, once he speak, we want to see Jesus and the wisdom. Also, dear Lord, at this special moment, we place our all of our lives in this special place. We are also praying for the guardian angels and the Holy Spirit to come and reveal us. Also, dear Father, we especially pray for each one of us individually here. Also, we ask our protection. Also, we pray for our families. Dear Lord, we want to say thank you. Also, we want to pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the three angels' message for these last days that we recognize your wisdom, dear Lord. Also, we pray, pray for the Seventh day Adventist churches all around the world and the administrations and the institutions and the people, those who are working. We pray for the members. Also, dear Father, we pray the people, those who do not know Jesus Christ in their life, and we ask and plead, dear Lord, please use us so that your message, the end time message, will be spread out to the world. Dear also, dear Father, in this precious moment, we dedicate our life and the thoughts and the minds once again, dear Lord. This will be our delighted time, dear Father. These all things I am in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Chapter 11, verse 9. I will modify it to my own version. Be happy, young man. 
means for me, be happy, church of God. While you are young, it means we are still alive, we have the hope, we are in the blessing. Let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. As we are enjoying the blessing of God and His church in the last days, that we have the hope But know that for all these things, God will bring in judgment. So while we are enjoying this blessing, this is the time, not only at this time, but throughout our life, to thanks to Him and praise Him and to Him. Especially this moment, this is the opportunity that we can share our love, manifest our love, by returning our tithes and walking in thanks So at this moment, uh, I would like to request uh,
Okay, so today I'm going to be telling you a story about a brother and a sister, much like me and Karan. And um, except Karan is, imagine Karan is about um, three years old and I'm about ten years old. And um, um, the name of the brother was David. We have David right here. <laughs> and the name of the sister was Sarah. And David and Sarah lived on a farm, and their parents were farmers. They earned their money by farming. And the thing about farming is that it's a family thing, and they all gather together every single day, and they go out and they work, and they you know, feed the chicken, and they go and plant seeds and things like that. And they worked really, really hard, 364 days of the year. There was one day of the year that they would go out and have a family picnic. And this was the day of the year when the, the trees had these sap, you know, sap of the trees. And they liked to use this as chewing gum because they didn't have chewing gum back then. They liked to chew on this. So one day, um, David was really, really sick. And it just so happened to be the day that um, the family would go out for the family picnic. So... <coughs> They asked Sarah to take care of David. So Sarah was really sad, but she didn't have a choice. So she stayed back and she took care of her brother. So the family went out and they were enjoying their picnic. And um, they, they had this picnic over on the other side of a hill. So um, when David uh, was sleeping, Sarah was thinking, maybe I can carry David with me and I can go to the picnic too. So she picked up David and she put on his hat and they started walking and she thought maybe I should go on a shortcut. So they started walking and walking and they went through this shortcut which was through the hill and the hill was really, really steep. If you missed a step, you would fall down and at the bottom of the river there was this um, river and they would fall down on, uh, into the river and there were sharp rocks in the river and you know what would happen after that. But so they started walking and Sarah was carrying David. And then suddenly Sarah slipped and then they both started rolling down the hill. And they were screaming and it was it was really painful for them and they were rolling down the hill and they were rolling down the hill. And then Sarah prayed to God and she prayed, Dear Jesus, please save me. And then she closed her eyes and both of them were rolling down the hill. And then when she opened her eyes she realized something. She wasn't rolling anymore. And they were on the side of the um, river. They were inside the river. So she, she got really scared. This time she was really scared. So she picked up David and they climbed up the hill and they went back home. And she never, never, ever told her parents what happened. So many, many years later, about 20 years later, when Sarah and David were older, one day Sarah was in her house and she got a call from her dad and her dad said, Sarah, you have to come and visit your dad. He's really, uh, you have to come and visit uh, David. He's really sick. So David, so uh, Sarah went and visited David. And then um, David called Sarah and he told Sarah, Sarah, come here. I have, I have something that's troubling me and called the whole family. So the whole family came together and they thought David was going to die because he was so sick. So then um, he said to Sarah, David told Sarah, um, I had a dream the other night and this dream, um, it showed me and you, we were little and we were rolling down a hill and then I saw an angel pick me up and then the angel picked you up too and put us on the side of the river and Sarah started to cry and she told her parents the story was true and, and then they all prayed together and after a few days, uh, David got better eventually. So the mor moral of the story is that Jesus has sent an angel for every single one of us and each of us have our own guardian angel to take care of us. If we are in trouble, we just have to pray to God and ask him to help us. Okay? So um, now we are going to pray.
Okay? So everyone, uh, please close your eyes and we're going to pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for sending your angels to come and protect us and to guide us because you love us so much. Help us to be able to come to you whenever we have problems and whenever we have um, trials in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. There perhaps is no better assurance of God's faithfulness than to know a God who knows each one of us by our names, even before we were named, and who has formed us even before we knew ourselves. The song that I'm going to sing is entitled, He Knows My Name. <clears throat> if you know the song, please worship with me, all right? I have a maker, he formed my heart, before even time began, my life was in his hands, he knows my name. my every thought he sees each tear that falls and he hears me when I call I have a father he calls me his own He'll never leave me, no matter where I go. And He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and he hears me when I call. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. And he sees each tear that falls and he hears me when I call. Yes, he hears me when I call. I've been given an impossible task. <laughs> First of all, I need to preach under these colors. <laughs> under this flag, well, I hope my sermon will not be related directly to it. And probably you know what I'm referring to. Yes. The symbol that it is used today for something else. The second aspect is that uh, I've been uh, allowed to speak 35 minutes. But uh, is this Indian time? Is this Filipino time? Western time? 
let's see. I set my clock, so I hope we will be able to finish on time. The third aspect that makes it impossible. How can you reinvent God's rainbow? When I was given this title, I thought, I thought, what shall I say? God's rainbow cannot be reinvented. God's rainbow can be understood and enjoyed, but not reinvented. So what shall I preach about? Let me create the context so you'll understand what I have in mind and what I picked up from the Bible. The rainbow comes in a certain context, in a particular context. The context is creation. And the rainbow appears naturally only in creation. If you want to see a rainbow, where do you go? Outside, right? The rainbow doesn't happen inside, naturally. The rainbow occurs outside. Why, what do you need for a rainbow to happen? You need water, you need sunshine, and most of the time you need clouds, because a rainbow occurs when the clouds open up and the sun shines through the clouds. So let's look at the creation first in order to understand why the rainbow was necessary. If you look at Genesis 1, you see something there. God is coming down to create. God is coming down to put the, the earth together. So what is he actually doing there? First of all, he is offering his own honor to his creation because God is an honorable God the whole act of creation is an act of honor and you'll see why because there is a lot of creativity involved there we call it creation and the words are related they have the same root creativity is there and creativity is also an honorable thing remember when an artist an artist displays uh, his paintings or his sculptures or the other type of art what people what do people do they praise him they honor him honor is related to creativity and God is there doing the same thing God is not only creating but he is also blessing and from the beginning God is blessing the human couple with a blessing, a specific blessing. Do you remember the blessing that Adam and Eve received from the beginning? Let's say it together. Genesis 1, 28. It says, Grow, multiply, bring fruit, and fill the earth. It's a very interesting blessing. Because... It says not only you have to grow, but it says do not stay together. Go and cover the earth, fill the earth. And that is a mission that the first couple receives to, um, for their life. Yes, grow, but grow has something to do with your, your mission. And uh, last but not least, God is sanctifying. Sanctifying. You know what sanctification and uh, holiness means? It means to be set aside, set apart. To receive something from God's character. And we will look a little bit in detail um, into what comes next. So creation, Genesis 1, then Genesis 2. Uh, a chapter in the life of this earth where God is sharing his honor with the first first humans but then comes Genesis chapter 3 what do we find here from chapter 3 on we talk about sin 
So, what is sin? How would you define sin? Separation from God, breaking the law of God. How else would you define sin? I would put it like this, no longer honor, but shame. When sin comes, honor is gone. And what replaces honor is, is shame. And this fight, this struggle between honor and shame will go on for the rest, for the rest of the biblical story. What is sin? Yes, it is honor, but honor is no longer going to God. Honor is used for yourself. You want to become honorable. And you will do everything and anything possible in order to reach your, your goal. So let's look at the first people, first humans on this earth. What did they do? Remember Cain and Abel? What is the story about? The story is about who is going to be honored. And you know the outcome. Cain wants to be honored, but Abel receives the honor. Cain feels ashamed, so what is he going to do? He is going to kill his brother in order, possibly, to get the honor that he receives. Is honor coming to him? No. Honor is not for the one who claims it. Honor is given. Honor comes from above. People started to be proud, no longer honorable, but proud. So in their hearts, they started to desire things. For example, since that moment and until today, and probably will continue, people started focusing no longer on the creator above, but on the creation. So today they say, well, God may be a creator, but he is limited by his own laws. So science is the one that tells us about God's laws. In nature, you see these laws. So God is limited, they say, by his own natural laws. What are they glorifying and honoring today? Who receives the Nobel Prize? Have you heard of God receiving the Nobel Prize? No, they are giving it to humans. They are praising the genius of human knowledge. They honor the creature, but not the creator, God. They go that far to deny God's existence. Well, when you deny God's existence, it's clearly no place and no room for honor given to a God. People started to carve images and they say, well, this is your God follow him or her or it bow down before it worship it and people started to do that but let me ask you a question how much honor can be in a in a sculpted statue it's made by whom by shameful people sinful people and how much honor is in that one to really bow down and worship it none nothing if you read what the prophet isaiah says he is even mocking people who are worshiping idols and he says well the carpenter is carving something and he puts it there and people start worshiping and what's the whole story nothing because that piece of wood has no power nothing creative in it no holiness in idols. Remember that in the story of creation we read about how God sanctified. Because he has the power. He is holy. A piece of wood has no power in it. Next. One, uh, people started to focus on their senses. And they started enjoying their own things. So. What do we have here? I want to have more. I want to become rich overnight. 
What do people do in order to do that? If you work hard, if you work hard, it takes you years, sometimes a lifetime, in order to become rich. But people said, no, we don't have the time to wait until we are old to enjoy it. We want it today. So what did they do? They start taking others as slaves. They start taking more slaves. They start doing injustice to people and oppressing people in order to become for themselves, to, to get for themselves the worthy things, to become rich. Now, sometimes people do not want to become slaves. What do they do? They oppose you. So people become violent in order to get what they wanted. How much honor is in violence? How much honor do you see in oppression? So some of you know very well what a caste system is. And the caste system was put in place in order to put people in a box and tell them you should not come out of this box. This is your place. Stay there. I can be rich, I can be wise, I can be important, I can get all the honor. You deserve no honor. That's what it is all about. So, people started looking for more honor. And they said, if I have one wife, what is that? Everyone has a wife. I want to have two wives. And then three wives, and then four wives, and even the Muslims say, oh, four is enough. But polygamy is something that people thought will bring them more honor. In reality, how much honor do people who have more wives have? Uh, have, you, have, you seen <laughs> have you seen a polygamous family? You should hear the quarreling between the wives and well you don't have to go there read the Bible and you will see what happens to patriarchs who have more wives they start competing because the wives want their honor too and who gets the highest honor well again you have to look carefully there because there is no honor coming from it the more wives you have, the more kids you have, the more you have to work to provide for all of them. Do you get more honor? You end up with iniquity, with defilement, and finally with, with shame. Remember what God started with in the creation story? Blessing people. What did they do? They killed this blessing. There was no longer a blessing to enjoy. It was just a fight for honor and to avoid shame. So, let's look at the next event. What's going on here? Noah's Ark and the animals. They have a place here. Let's look at the story. What is God bringing on board? First of all, we read about Noah that he was blameless. Now, immediately my question is, how is it possible for a human being to be blameless? Because we read from the Bible and we know very well that we are sinners. Is there a person without blame, without a spot, a righteous person? No, but God declares Noah a righteous person, blameless person. So, Noah is entrusted a mission. For 120 years he has to preach. What is he preaching about? What is his assignment? God. About God. Right. What about God? That God is an honorable person. And God needs to be worshipped. And people need to come back to God to bring him honor. But Noah also is praised for something. And the Bible says it very clearly. Noah did all the Lord had commanded him. You know what this is called? Obedience. Noah is an obedient person. All the others are beyond this definition. 
So Noah is actually calling people to become obedient to God. And God says something, I am going to destroy this earth. What are you going to do? I am building an ark here and this is the chance for you to come in and be saved from destruction. So people start listening to him, people start arguing with him. Finally people end up ignoring him. So for 120 years he is a missionary. What is the end result of the story? His mission is accomplished because God manages to save some. Now the question is how successful was Noah in his mission? Seven converts with himself eight. Eight people, eight people in the boat. Now, how successful is a, an evangelist with only eight people to baptize? For 120 years. And we work sometimes two weeks. And we expect hundreds <laughs> to be baptized. Well, the question is, who's going to be honored? People or God? When God is going to be honored, let God do his job. He is going to convince people. And people during Noah's time said, no, no, or maybe later, or maybe we'll think about it. In the end, only eight people were saved. So God was looking at the, the situation there. What shall I do? When people reject me plainly, I have no chance. So there are consequences. First consequence is that God restarts life on planet Earth. And I like what Ellen White says about this. Love, no less than justice, demanded that God's judgments should put a check on sin. All people did before the flood was to sin, to enjoy sin, to bring more sin, to bring more shame, to shame God, to shame themselves. And God said, no, this is no, no place for humans to live on. I need to restart. And I like what they did when they got out of the boat. The Bible says that they built an altar and Noah brought an offering. What is that? That is honor returned to God. The first thing after they came out of the boat, they returned honor to God. They also expressed their gratitude to God. And they said, God, thank you for saving us. Although we no longer have all that beautiful garden with all the fruit and vegetables and so on, but still, thank you for keeping us alive. God said, all right, I gave you a blessing. Although I'm going to reset life on earth, the blessing remains the same. And it's interesting to read that the blessing Noah gets and receives is the same like Adam received. Remember the blessing? Grow, multiply, and fill the earth. So humans were supposed to do the same. The interesting thing I find in this passage is that the blessing is not said only once, but twice. Like God wanted to make sure that they understand it. See, the first people stayed together. They did not want to fill the earth. What are you going to do this time? I remind you, you have to go and fill the earth. Let's look at the rainbow. God establishes a covenant. And as we read the scripture this morning, he said, I'm making a covenant that will, I will never destroy the earth like this time with floods. The entire earth will never be destroyed like it was this time. So you will see there in the clouds, in the sky, a rainbow. That's a sign of my covenant. And... Again, I find interesting that God says, this is not a covenant with you. This is a covenant, the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. 
Oh, this is a kind of language that you'll, you'll hear repeated later on in the, in the Bible, in the biblical history. But every time this language is repeated, it has something to do with mission. Remember, all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Do you remember how this language is repeated later on? Every nation, every tribe, every language, every ethnic group, every kind of creature is part of this covenant. When you see the rainbow in the sky, God says, you should have no fear. Remember what happened when Adam and Sin sinned? They immediately hid. Why? Because the Bible says they were ashamed and they were afraid. When God asked them, why did you hide? Why did you hide? Uh, um, Adam responded, because I was afraid. God says, no reason to be afraid. Look at the rainbow in the sky. That's my promise. I will take care of you. I am in control. If you will honor me, I will respond to that and I will give you no fear, feelings of trust, of having faith. Let's look at the rainbow. Do you like the colors? Yes. Well, look here. <laughs> like the colors? Very nice. But you know what the rainbow comes from? comes from light. Have you tried to look in, a, in the light? Can you? Try to look in the sun. Not now. There is no sun. Shine. <laughs> but the rainbow is the result of sun going through water molecules. So look directly into the sun. What do you see? It's painful, you cannot look there. It's too strong, too powerful. And if you look for more than two, three minutes in the sun, I can guarantee you that you either will get a spot in your vision or you'll get blind. Because looking directly into the sun is not what God intended for us. God intended for us to look at the light filtered through what we called and we told you this morning to the stratosphere that filters in such a way the sun, the light, the heat that we can live in on this on this earth. So yes, light, but God wants God wants us to look at this first light. That means to look at the beauty of light. Looking straight into the light, there is no beauty. There is just energy. But that energy has to be diffused, to be colored, to be clothed in such a way that the human eye will like it. Light dispersed. And this is a lesson for us that I will draw at the end of this presentation. Finally, there is a covenant here. And the covenant says, I will honor you. I will honor you. Every time you will see the rainbow in the sky, remember that I am here to save you, to honor, to give you honor. Well, unfortunately, the story doesn't end here. Immediately after this story, we read in the Bible another story, a shameful one. Can you see how the episodes of honor alternate with the ones on shame? And every time God is saying, I will give you honor, people say, all we are is shame, shameful. Noah gets drunk. What is happening here? Out of three sons, one brings him shame. The other two, the Bible says, cover his shame. And the story ends with a curse. And not only with a curse, immediately we are told about Noah that lives a certain number of years and then he dies. Well, it is a restart, but the first start, the first beginning was without death. This restart includes, includes death. Actually, the episodes of shame are so often, so frequent, that sometimes we hear 
and we ask the question ourselves, where is honor? Where is honor? Let's look at the next chapters. Genesis 10 and 11, you have there some stories, some genealogies. And what are the genealogies about, all about? Sometimes we say, well, those are the signs of honor because who you are to which family belong may bring you honor or, or shame. And who picks in his or her genealogy people who bring him or her shame? No one. Everyone wants to mention only the most honorable people in the family. So we read their name after name. And we think in our minds these were honorable people. But in the end we find out that those were sinners. And sin brings shame. We also have the story of the Tower of Babel. You remember what happens there? People started to come together and say, God told us to go out, but we will stay together. Don't leave. Let's build a tower. Let's challenge this God. Let's challenge his honor. And God says he had to come down to see what people were doing and to shame them. I don't know how you imagine in your mind the story of the Tower of Babel, but I imagine that when people started to communicate to each other, which they did before, and suddenly they don't hear the common language that they were talking. They start blaming each other, they start farty fighting each other, and they start spreading around. Not because they are honorable people, but because they cannot understand each other, they cannot stay together. Each of them has to leave that place in shame. God came down to shame them, not to give them honor. Genesis 12. What is going on here? Do you recognize the men? Abraham is called by God. And Abraham is called by God in a certain way. If you read Genesis 12, 1 to 3, you will see there certain elements. Very clear. God is promising him what? He's promising him a piece of land. Do you know how important land was back in those times? If you had land, you were somebody. You were an honorable person. Without land, you were like a slave. You had no, no honor. Then God promises him also a, a name. And God is also promising him a, a son. Now, I've learned this, that in many non-Western cultures, having a daughter is somehow of a less honorable situation. And everybody is looking for a son, because if you have a son, then your honor reserve is full. Well, let's think about that. Sometimes sons are honorable, sometimes they are not. Sometimes daughters are honorable, sometimes they are not. So it is not about the, having a son or a daughter. It is about God's blessing. And God promised a son so Abraham will be satisfied and fulfilled and looking forward to the, the day. But Abraham is also told something. Yes, I am giving you honor, but the honor is not going to stay with you. You will have to share that blessing, that honor. I am blessing you in order for you to bless others. Yes, you will have to share with others the blessing. So Abraham is sent on a, on a mission to bless others. Remember, mission is always honorable. Because God is a missionary. And he wants to share with us so we can share with others his, his honor. When he put the rainbow in the sky, God said, remember, every time you look at it, it's not your honor. It is mine that it is shared with, with you. And when you see the rainbow in the sky, remember another thing, that I sent you on a mission. Your mission is to grow, to multiply, and to fill the earth with my, my knowledge. Let's look at a few other passages. By the way, if you have the curiosity to 
find out how many times the rainbow is used in the Bible, you will be amazed. Only four places in the Bible. So I was asking the question, why others are not mentioning the rainbow? Did the rainbow did, uh, did, did not appear during their time? Well, every time it rains, it looks like there is a chance for the rainbow to appear, and it rains so often. But people did not notice that. Second time beyond Genesis where rainbow is appearing is in Ezekiel. And I find very interesting connections here. Let me read it to you. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And by the way, the term glory is the same translated as honor. So the honor of the Lord is related to the rainbow. When I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. And if you move down the passage, you will see what the voice said. Son of man, I am sending you. Eat this scroll and then go and speak to the people of Israel. I am sending you. Can you see how these elements are tied together? The rainbow signifying the glory of God and uh, God is sending the person on a mission. Okay, this is Ezekiel. If you want to read more, you have it there. Let's move. <coughs> Revelation chapter 4 is the third passage where the rainbow is used. Let's read about it. The one who sat on the throne had the appearance of jasper and ruby. You know what these are? Precious stones. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. But there was a purpose here too. Let's read down. Four living creatures are there. What is their role? Their mission is to give glory, honor, and praise to God. And this is very clearly stated there. Not only that, but around the throne there are also 24 elders. And their mission there is to give glory to God, to bow down and give honor to Him. Interestingly enough, if you read down in the passage, in the same chapter, a scroll is there. A scroll that needs to be opened, and there is no one to open the, the scroll. And finally, the slain lamb is there to come and open the scroll. There is a mission. There is a scroll there. Let's look at the last passage that talks about a rainbow in the Bible. Revelation chapter 10. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow about his head. He was holding, interestingly, a little scroll. Take the scroll and eat it. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. I think I've said enough for you to now see the connection. Every time the rainbow is there, every time God's honor is involved and is present. And every time God's presence and honor is there, humans are sent on a mission. This little scroll that appears every time that the rainbow is mentioned in scripture is a very interesting study for you to do later on. Let me finish. The 35 Indian minutes are over. We are called today to diffuse the light. For people today to look in the light of God directly will be blinding. And Ellen White even says, uh, um, or uses a sentence that says, people become blinded by refusing the light. Dealing directly with the light is not good. We are called to be priests, crystals. This is what we use in uh, physics labs to teach young people how the rainbow occurs. And then you point a laser light through the prism, 
But what comes out of it is the beauty of light. People want to see the beauty of light. God wants us to display his beauty. We are on a mission today to show people not only how to take care of their shame, God is doing that, but to show people that they can become honorable again. When the rainbow will uh, occur, appear again in the sky, please remember that God entrusted us with a mission to display his honor, to display his beauty, so people will be attracted again to him. The rainbow, it's not about us. The rainbow is not about what color we are or what preferences we have. The rainbow is about God's honor and his mission to us. Let's be a display of God's beauty today. Amen. Amen.